Welcome to the Why Not Podcast with me, Chrissy Hawkins. In a world where everybody asks you why, I'm here to ask why not. So sit back and relax or walk and listen and join me on this journey as we try to answer this never-ending question. What makes people say why not? Hi guys, welcome back to Why Not. So I have a very exciting episode with you today. And I am going to be speaking to the winner of the public vote from the Grassroots Rider Academy. So that is Megan Norton. You may have seen her on YouTube. If you haven't, check it out. And we are going to talk all about how she got into horses, um, all about her pony Timmy, but also the mindset it takes to become the winner of a show like that. You know, who captures the public heart, who is the one that everyone wants to see do well and it might surprise you but she nearly gave up horse riding and equestrianism right before she got Timmy so it's amazing how things can turn around in such a short space of time so I really hope you enjoy this episode with Megan Norton. Hi guys welcome back to Why Not so the guest I have today with you, or for you guys, it, you may recognise as the winner of the public vote from the Grassroots Rider Academy. She's an amateur equestrian and also now a bit of a podcaster as well, I do believe. <laughs> so this is Megan Norton. Welcome to the podcast. How are you, Megan? I'm good. Thanks. How are you, Chrissy? Yeah, good. Um, So firstly, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself, where you are, who you are, what do you do? Yeah, so... My name is Megan Norton. Um, I'm 25 now, getting old, and I, <laughs> um, I live in County Antrim, so Northern Ireland, and I have two horses, one Hattie and the other Timmy. Timmy is the horse that I did the Grass Gazette Writers Academy on, and we won the public vote, which was amazing. Um. The viewers know what they want. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mainly do work in Hunter. I used to event Hattie and then I sort of went towards the work in Hunter scene. Um, and yeah, then I got Timmy. He evented previously um, with his owner prior. So this is all new to him. Um, and he seems to take to it really well. So I work to be able to have my horses. <laughs> I suppose uh, this is something I'd spoke to with uh, Gary about during um, one of the podcast interviews and he mentioned how people assume that, you know, horse riding people have loads of money. Do you find you get that as well? So many people say that to me and I'm like, honestly, you have no idea. We literally go to work to pay for these animals and vets, mortgages and farriers and physios and you name it, whatever the horse needs, the horse gets. Meanwhile, we could be eating beans on toast for a week, but it's okay because the horse is happy and healthy. So, um, yeah, it might look like a glamorous lifestyle, but um, at times, yes, it can be. Um, but for the majority of it, at the end of the day, we do live in Ireland, so it rains like 365 days of the year. So <laughs> we're usually out there in our waterproofs, and our raincoats, which um to me isn't that glamorous. Well, you know, something for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you have a grey horse as well, who is like borderline white. I don't know how you do winters with him. Oh, uh, honestly. Well, my bay horse, Hattie, she, she is a stinker. Like she just rolls in mud. And if there's somewhere to roll and get dirty, she's in it. Timmy actually... I'm quite lucky. I think he knows. Um, he's quite proud of himself. So he like in the stable, he's actually pretty clean. Um, you know, like before a show, I could wash them the day before, and as long as I have his bandages on and his hood on, he's usually okay. Maybe a few e touch ups, but like nothing, nothing major. And then you put him out to the field, and he will not roll if it's dry. But you can guarantee if it's been raining, he literally starts rolling before you get the head colour off and that's no exaggeration Um, my dad was helping me one day put them all out it was like near the start of um the year last year and I gave him 
Timmy to lead to turn out because he'd be a bit calmer to turn out than Hattie would be. And he literally just dropped as soon as he got into the field. And my dad was like, oh my goodness, what do I do? And I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you about that. Sorry. (laughs) So, yeah. Uh, It's nice that he doesn't do when it's dry because no matter what the weather, any time I had Sam clean, he'd put him out and he'd like, he'd find that one patch that's a little bit damp and just face through it. Yeah. And whenever it is, like, people say I'm an over-rugger, but I'm just like, no, you just don't, don't own a grey horse. Um. So, yeah. But no, generally, he is quite good, Um. apart from the field situation thing. But, yeah, good par hose and gets rid of it. <laughs> I he loves that. Yeah. <laughs> he loves me. <laughs> Right, so let's kind of take it back to the start. How did you initially get into horse riding? Um, <laughs> out of pure luck, I think. My, I wasn't, like, my mum didn't bring me into horses or anything, even though my mum is the horsey person in my family. Um, It was actually my auntie. My dad's sister um, was minding us, and she took us to a riding school. Um, not far from us actually it's in Crown Dantrum still and I had no like I literally was wearing a grey like Tesco tracksuit and a pair of welly boots and my hair was around my eyes and yeah I was just you know them kids you see and they just haven't a clue what they're doing but they're in the middle of everything that was me so whenever I heard yeah, whenever I heard that we were going horse riding, I was like, oh my goodness, this is so much fun. And then when we came home, I didn't shut up about it at all. And my granda, my mum's dad, he he was the horsey person next to mum. So he was like, ooh, Margaret, which is my mum. She was like, she's going to have to go to riding lessons. And, you know, you got your chance when you were a kid. And my mum was like, absolutely not no not happening um so I sort of twisted my granda's arm a little and I was like well then you can take me and so he was the sucker and he took me and we went to Grancha Equestrian so that's in Bangor so we went there and Adrian Stewart which is the owner of the centre we went there for years um And I had so much fun. I rode in the riding school once a week, I think. And then did like the pony club or pony camp um, things whenever school was off and stuff like that, which was so much fun. And we did like grooming competitions and stuff. And still at this stage, my mum was like, you know, Billy, which is my granda. Mum was like, Billy, you need to stop this. You need to like cut this because she's not getting a horse. I know the cost of it. And I know what my child's like. Like once she starts something, that's it. So anyway, we kept going and I was riding any pony I got my hands on. I literally just threw myself on. Absolutely no fear. I have had hundreds of falls. And for a mum that was like totally anti me getting into horses, mm. we <laughs> it's funny, but it's not funny. It's funny now. But anyway, kind of funny when you've seen her in the Rider Academy and how involved she was. I know. That she was against you in horses. Yeah. Well, she wasn't against it. She was just new, like the work and the money and all the stuff that sort of went into it. But we were um, showing a horse for a buyer. And I think I was like 10. And the, the viewers were there and I was riding it around the paddock and stuff. And it was going great. And then all of a sudden it just like bolted up bolted off on me and I went flying absolutely flying over its head and all I remember is my mum literally come in and pick me and picking me up and popping me back on the horse or the pony and away we went and that literally memory is in the front of my head at all times every time I think of like how did I actually end up here whenever she at the start was totally like negative about it so yeah, the short answer there is my auntie. Yeah. So it's interesting you're saying that you have that memory of your mum just like picking you up and putting you back on the horse. 
and obviously that's a saying that like we use a lot you know just get back up on the horse you know unless you're absolutely broken people get back yeah. up on the horse. even <laughs> when they are they don't realize they are because they're too busy getting on the horse but yeah. um, have you found that kind of mentality come true in other parts of your life as well oh goodness yeah I well a lot of people would describe me as Thran which in a way is probably true I'm not gonna deny that um but like Thran so like I'm real stubborn uh, okay um and it is true like I'm not gonna even try and deny it because yeah <laughs> but just like if I if I say I'm gonna do something or I put my mind to something like I am doing it and there is no man on this earth that's gonna tell me I can't do it even if I fail and I still did it I don't care (laughs) yeah no do you know what it's a great way to do it because so many people don't do things for that exact reason they're afraid they will fail so is this the kind of mentality you had when you saw the Rider Academy come up um I actually (laughs) whenever I applied for the Academy I had I hadn't even got Timmy for a year yeah I think I had him like nine months or something um so like I'm still trying to figure him out and I mean I'm still trying to figure him out but um I just entered it because I'd done so much with my other horse Hattie and I was sort of like slowing her down to send her for breeding and I was like oh, I'd love to do this on Hattie meanwhile she's standing in stud so that just wasn't an option and so I was like oh screw it we'll enter and put Timmy in it and see what we can do and yeah went down to the paddock stood and see when I watched the video back of my my application I look so awkward like it's unbelievable it's actually quite funny whenever I watch it back I am standing there like oh my word Megan what are you doing you look like a statue just standing there and like someone's putting words in your mouth but yeah I was just okay I feel like I applied on a whim thinking that I would never get anywhere in it um just because like where I come from like there's not a big amount of opportunities like that um in terms of like we do have to travel to get to good shows and stuff like that it's not just on our doorstep um so I thought oh you know those other people that are out competing at higher levels and more often than what we are you know they'll get picked because they're better well in my eyes they were better um so I genuinely didn't expect anything to come of it. Um, so yeah, I applied thinking, oh, sure, what the heck? You know, it is what it is. And it turns out that it was good enough. <laughs> Do you think that helped that you were just kind of like, yeah, we'll see what happens? It made it easier yeah. to make it like. Yeah, because I am a very competitive person. Like I put a lot of pressure on myself all the time. Um, and I think that because I just got him, I think that's why I didn't have a lot of pressure on myself because I think I'd done I'd done probably like eight or nine shows on him. And we'd done loads of skilling and stuff, obviously, but actual proper shows, probably nine shows or something. Um, and one of them was the day before I made the video. <laughs> and I'd never actually competed in a show cross country on him on grass I'd only went schooling so um like that was all totally new to us I knew he was capable of it because he did it with his past owners um and excelled at it but I just obviously the ground and stuff like that you just didn't have the chance to get out so I think yeah I just sort of did it for a bit of fun and I think that made the phone call even better because I, I wasn't expecting it. Like I wasn't sitting there waiting on it. Um, I was like, sure, if they ring me, they ring me. If they don't, they don't. You know, there's a lot of riders in this country and there will be a lot to pick from. And there was over a thousand entries anyway, so... Yeah, there was. Yeah. How did it feel to get that phone call? I thought someone scammed me. <laughs> yeah. I, thought someone, I thought someone had set me up because I, t- like, I didn't tell many people that I applied for it. Because I hate when people are like, you know, asking and asking and asking, how you or did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Um, but whenever Eva rang me, I was like, 
hello like I was so like skeptical about it I was waiting for someone to be like ha ha joke but it was actually Aoife and I, I was on Timmy at the time and Aoife was like do you want to get off you know be safe and health and safety and all that and I was like no no it's fine of course Aoife said that yeah <laughs> But um, yeah, me being me, I was like, no, no, we're fine. We're fine. I'm just standing in the paddock. It could be worse. So, and then she told me and she was like, are you free on, was it like the 6th or sixth or 9th of August? I can't remember exactly what date it was. And she was like, are you free on that date to come down and slide off for like final selections? And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. No idea what she'd even said until like the follow up um, chat I had with her. And I rang my mom and she didn't answer the phone. And I was like, oh my goodness, like, like seriously, woman, this is important. But yeah, I I still didn't believe it until I was in Slade Off because I was like, this this doesn't happen to me. Like stuff like this. Yeah. <laughs> I was shocked. What was it like pulling in the gates of Slade Off and realizing you were actually there? It was amazing. <laughs> Um, terrifying absolutely terrifying going up that driveway I was like this is Buckingham Palace and then we got up and I seen the stables and I was like oh if only I would honestly I'd give a kidney for that that yard mm-hmm. Um, I would give a kidney for one of the stables never mind the yard <laughs> and I sleep in those stables myself let alone the horse you could lunge a horse in them stables yeah they are huge <laughs> Um, and I think the fact that Lauren and her mum and everything was so inviting, it made us feel at ease because obviously we were there. It was a competition, if you want to think of it. And, you know, we were all against each other for the place. Like there was only five places and there was nine riders. So I think the fact that we were so welcomed and everyone was so friendly and all the grassroots team were f- so friendly and helpful and genuinely interested and cared um that made it so so nice because I think maybe I'm so used to going to like showing shows and working hunters and stuff and you know yourself like shows in general can be a little bit bitchy Mm. you know everyone's out to win and some people just don't want to see other people do better um And I feel sorry for people like that because, you know, we all do good and we all do bad at times and that's just the way it is. Um, And I think if you can be happy for other people to do good, then you're a much better person. Um, And I went down to Slade Off with that in mind. I was like, if I get it, I get it. And if I don't, I don't. Like, don't get me wrong. I was absolutely busting for a place. But, um, you know, horses are horses and that's how they perform in the day and I was just lucky enough that Timmy was good I mean he was spicy but that's Timmy <laughs> yeah he's a he's a cracker of a horse like he's he's definitely a bit mad but like it's just yeah. he loves what he's doing isn't it it's no there's no yeah. badness in him oh no absolutely not he you come into the yard and he's he's standing there and he could be standing eating his hay net and he sees you and it's head straight over the door and he's like waiting for you to take him out and waiting for him to ride and stuff and like he just loves his job you never have to you know make him do anything not that I would ever make him do anything but it's so nice to have a horse that's so willing to do everything like he's a hard ride don't get me wrong and he really tests you um but it's worth it really worth it yeah no I agree and I suppose that's one thing that we noticed as well is like you guys were even though you're competing against each other, everyone seems so supportive and like, you know, you still see you, like you guys like interacting and hanging out together and stuff like that. How important was that for you guys to have that kind of support system with each other? It was, it was so good. Um, And again, I had never done anything like that before. And um, like that sort of community group stuff. And I was just so used to going to shows and it being you know pressure 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 like you need to do well you need to do well and then thinking like what are people saying about me at the side of the ring oh my goodness like you know if you got a bad stride or 
did a bad transition or a bad movement you were like oh my goodness I hope nobody's seen that but you know at the academy everyone was cheering you on and if you did something wrong it was like oh well whatever who cares um, and then when you did something right everyone was like oh my goodness you're amazing um, and it was genuine it wasn't like fake or anything which is so nice because you go to some shows and people are like oh my goodness you did so good blah 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 and you're like they didn't mean that at all not one bit but at the academy it was it was genuine yeah what is it like when you're at those shows and you know people are wishing like bad on you or like you know they're being fake when they when they say oh you did well like yeah I t- again like I keep my circle small for that reason because I don't want I just like I just don't have time for that um I'm out to do the shows on my horse because that's what I enjoy like it's an expensive sport and if you're not going to do it for the love of the sport then you shouldn't be at it because everyone is in the same game everyone wants the same end goal which is to win but at the same time you know it's a journey you don't just come out and start winning from the get-go and if you do well then you're just one of the lucky ones um and for me I started off with Hattie and she was unbroken and I was 12 so I really did start at the bottom and had to you know work my way up the ladder and I think that has made me the rider that I am because I appreciate absolutely everything because I wasn't handed it I have had to work for it um and the amount of times that I felt like giving up and then I was like Megan catch yourself on and like it's got me to where I am and it's got me the standard of horse that I have the minute which I'm so grateful for um to even be able to have him never mind have the ride off him so yeah I think it just puts into perspective you as a person how you react to other people's success yeah have you found it's gotten worse or is it just always been like that um when I used to event eventers were also always like so how would you put it encouraging mm. um and I think it's because obviously you've got like um either dressage and the show jump and, and the cross country like it's intense um, I'm not saying working hunter isn't intense because no. heck it is um, and there's a lot goes into your preparation for the workers because at the end of the day you have to have your horse schooled in a way that you can allow a judge to get on and take them round and ride and then you ride and then you jump and it's a lot and usually the atmosphere is very big um, and it's just trying to get your horse out to places and you know schooled in places as well as you can in situations that you'll come up in shows in um, and I'm just lucky that I work the way I work I'm able to go out like during the daytimes which I know a lot of people don't but it's just because of like I work shifts so like my days off are usually during the week so I just throw them on the box and away we go somewhere um and I think that just really encourages you when you have to do it yourself like yeah. all of it on your own yeah it is it's a lot of work like especially if you're doing it on your own yeah like, and like my dad like mom and dad are really good um like when I was at uni and stuff mom used to ride Hattie because obviously I was away and um I'd come home on a Friday and ride Friday Saturday Sunday well I actually came home to go to work to keep her but um yeah I would ride her on a Friday Saturday and Sunday and then I'd go away again on Sunday evening and that was me gone all week so I think like I really appreciated their help for those four years that I was gone um and now like mum still comes to all the shows and definitely keeps keeps tabs on me to make sure that I'm, I'm still doing the work um but it's because she wants to see me do well and like encourages me but is also my biggest critic in a good way um, and I wouldn't it. yeah and yeah I just I'd say I'm pretty lucky um you know if I'm away or if I'm sick or 
whatever like they'll always say do you want some help and maybe in me I'm like no I'm fine even if I can't walk straight lines I'm like no no I'm fine I'm fine um like dad the other day he was like let me muck out and I was like no no I need to do it because I have to fix yours anyway and it, it wasn't that I was being unappreciative it's just whenever you're so used to doing it on your own seven days a week you have your ways and you just get set in them um like don't get me wrong I did let him muck out but then I did it again after him um <laughs> I know that feeling I swear like so often I'm like no no you're grand I'll do it and it's not because I don't want the help it's because you won't do it the way I want it yeah I know and they know that I'm not being unappreciative they just know that I do things in my way and then I know it's like I have a little checklist in my head and I sort of go through it whenever I'm doing the horses every day and it's like right is that done is that done is that done and if someone else does it then it throws me off track Mm. I get you and you know you mentioned there as well that like there was times when you th- thought about giving up why why were you, why did that happen or um sort of for two reasons so recently um Hattie went for breeding and I slowly I slowly brought her out of work um so she went to stud now it'll be three years ago um and she took in full and it was amazing I was so happy I was like I'm gonna be a horse mom (laughs) a horse (laughs) granny really and (laughs) I was over the moon and everything was going great and then at heartbeat she she had aborted it and honestly I literally cried on the spot in the vet and the vet was totally like I'm really not good with human tears and I was like no no it's fine I'm really not good with human tears either unless they're my own and um so that was okay we had to start again and I was like oh it's just a little mishap or whatever but yeah cut the story short and she never went back in full I don't know what happened but like it's like people some people just can't get pregnant some horses just can't get pregnant um and that's that and so that really put me down in the drain for with that because obviously I'd had her so long and I was so excited to breed from her and I'd always wanted this Um, Mm. from I would say she was maybe eight that was my goal like I was like once she's you know done what she needs to do and you know I feel like she needs to slow down I'll take a fall off her and then that'll be my next horse Mm. and so that just didn't happen and in the middle of the whole thing like I brought her back into work during the winter um, and we did shows and she was still winning and still getting her sashes and still winning all the championships. And I was just like, okay. So I tried again the next year, nothing, the whole season. Like she spent, she spent the whole summer, spring and summer in stud. And I was quite lucky that the stud she was at, the girl was a vet. So I knew that she was getting taken care of really, really well. Um, and I wasn't worried about her um, because she is my child. <laughs> but yeah she came home and I was like no that's it I was scared of something happening to her at that stage just with so much like so much work had been done sort of to the reproductive cycle and all that and I was like no we need to stop um, and at the end of the day as well like it was just mounting up into piles of bills mm. and I was like you know you need to stop at some stage so for that reason I was like right I'd be scared if something happened to her I'd never forgive myself so that really put me down because I was like you know I've worked her and she's gave me so much and I can't even like give a fault to her um so that really upset me and then years ago again it's just the negativity like you go to shows and you just want to go out and have fun with your horse but you have someone sitting at the side nattering away even though like they don't know how many times you bet you fell off that week just in order to get the preparation in like there was times where I sat on the mountain block before I got on and just cried because I was like this is gonna go bad I know it's gonna go bad and one of the guys in the yard came up to me and he was like are you okay and I was like I'm fine I just need to cry it out and again like you know so like horsey people are so like horse like they just want the horse to be okay Mm-hmm. And people are not their like strong point. Um, 
and he came over and he was like are you are you all right and I was like yeah yeah sobbing away to myself and um, thinking like I had the world on my shoulders even though I didn't but um I was like no, no I just need to cry for a minute and I'll be fine I can get on and then I got on and she bucked me off and you know the story there but um I think I think I was just so fed up of the amount of work I was putting in and getting absolutely nowhere mm-hmm. and then you see everybody else like doing so well and you're like like why is it only me but it's not only me you know mm. everybody goes through those stages like I am at the minute <laughs> but we'll get over them um I just lost the love of it because you put so much in and I got absolutely nothing out of it I wasn't even enjoying it it was a task I was coming home from work and I was like oh for flip's sake I still have the horses to do um whereas now I'm like okay I need to go I need to go I'm going to do the horses like you know work work I have to go to work obviously but um it's like as fast as I can get home it's like I'm late to be to the house it doesn't even make sense but I'm like I'm gonna be late for the horses <laughs> um yeah what I, changed I, I think whenever I got Timmy I'd never even tried Timmy I seen a picture and that was it and um, my friend was moving away and he was riding him at the time and he was like if you want him he's there if not like no hard feelings or whatever and I was like well I've got nothing to ride and I'm bored out of my head in terms of I'm standing looking at all these shows and I can't go and yeah sure why not what have I got to lose um so I got him he dropped him up and I brought him into work and I started getting back out to shows and I started enjoying riding um and I think because I was just so upset from the breeding end of it that at this at this stage I was like I literally will be just happy to go hacking and go for a canter and pop an odd jump and then sure look at us now <laughs> yeah um I think the fact that I got a horse that I could enjoy and was fun um helped bring it back it's interesting you saying that as well about the breeding because I think people outside of the industry wouldn't realize they just think oh yeah you they just breed the horse whatever they want new ones but like when you've had like she was like your first horse and you know having having a foal out out of her is like continuing on and getting to still keep her do you know what I mean yeah see that was my whole idea behind it I was like okay I produced her myself if you want to call it that and got her to where she was and then I was like right her legacy will live on like I didn't want to ride her until she was lame or unhappy like I could still go out there tomorrow and put the tack on her and she would still give me a run for my money um which I love about her but you know when you've had them so long you just want them to like enjoy their life and retirement and get fat and hairy and muddy and um yeah just appreciate what they did for you you know she gave me what 12 13 years of riding and competitions um and she was never rarely sick or sorry they all have their little moments but like she really didn't give me any hassle at all um and I was like oh the least I can do for her is you know retire her and let her enjoy being a horse so I was glad that I could do that for her and then I got Timmy so ideally I would have loved to take a fall off her and sort of carry on her legacy if you want to see it as that way um because I just love I just love I just love the fact that if I had a bread from her, then in like say six years' time, she'd be out competing, and then I'd be like, "Oh, you know, you're breeding the line on." Mm. And I think, especially when you've had them for so long and they have like that meaning to you, um, it's so important. Yeah, no, it's it it makes so sense. You can kind of like even like hear the emotion in in your voice of like thinking about yeah. how you do it, like you know, no, but like. Same, like I, you say that about it. I probably kept Sam in very light work now, but for far too long because it was, you don't want to let go. And he's a gelding, so I'm not getting anything out of him. But yeah. like that kind of thing, you know, you like, you, 
now I'm like he's retired after getting injured I'm like yeah probably should have stopped a, a bit sooner yeah. now that I think about it like you know he still enjoyed jumping but he wasn't really interested anymore um yeah. so I'm kind of like yeah letting him out getting fat and hairy and he's living his best life over there and all he do is bring him food now so he's you kind of only think about it later but it is that thing they're so sentimental to you you don't want to yeah I'd be so scared of something happening to her um and now she just eats haylitch all day as much as she likes and then she'll hopefully get out to the field here soon um if it ever stopped raining but yeah. yeah she she loved her job and I just thought right after the breeding thing I was like I'm not bringing you back into full-time work and I have Timmy to ride on and take me further and do what I want to do. So I was like, there's absolutely no reason for me to be riding you when you can be happy and retired. Um, and she's not the kind of horse that you can tack up one day and not tack her up for five days. She she's she's another Timmy. Um, she wants to be ridden and she wants out every day. And she will make you aware that you didn't ride her the day before. She yeah, it's a little spicy. <laughs> You have a certain type of horse you enjoy. I do. I do. I love blood horses. Oh, it is. They're they're interesting, all right. Yeah. I mean, they're not everybody's cup of tea, but then, you know, the heavier horses aren't my cup of tea. So we all have our preference. It's like people. Yeah, exactly. No, that's totally fair. Like, I don't know everything for cobs. I don't know what it is. Just chunky lads. I love them. Um, (laughs) They can be powerful too, as well. Yeah. Oh, Um, God, yeah. But uh, yeah, like there's there's different horses for courses is the way, isn't it? Like you know yeah, totally, totally. Um, I think because I never went through the phase of like pony club, and I never had a pony of my own. I just sort of rode like the riding school ponies. Um, I think now the fact that I get to ride like friends ponies, like show ponies and Oregon hunter ponies, for them, it brings back like childhood, mm. like the pony era that I never had. Um, and I think that keeps me really interested in the sport and the love for it because it's a you know I'm getting a variation I'm not doing the same thing every day mm. I get you I actually didn't really have that pony club phase either it was just riding school ponies and then I yeah. got Sam so it's the kind of thing like you know you can have what you like you like what you you've had like so he was like a cobby guy and then anything I've leased since has been kind of cobby yeah yeah you just sort of get set in your little ways of what you like and that's fine yeah no so when you went to the rider academy obviously you weren't just riding you were being interviewed you were being like you were obviously being filmed while you're riding and everything how was that like um the getting filmed when riding was okay because I didn't like the whole crew I didn't even realize they were there at times because you're just so focused on your horse and um, so I much preferred to be an in saddle part um simply because it was me and my horse and I feel like I'm much more confident when I am with my horse but the interview bit like I was terrified not gonna lie I think my first interview um who was it with Gary yeah probably was with Gary and he the was like camera Gary was getting in front of it oh yeah he loves the camera doesn't he I yeah. love him um he <laughs> he stopped me like halfway through it and he was like okay stop and I was like oh, I've done something wrong and he was like relax and I was like I am relaxed even though my shoulders were nearly touching my ears mm-hmm. and he was like just relax you look so awkward and I was like okay well I've never done this before like what do you want me to do (laughs) and he was like just relax pretend you're talking to your friend and I'm like yeah but there's a camera in my face um and I think once I got over the first one and I was like oh that's actually all right and then I got chatting with Kate and Kate's just like I don't know a natural with a camera Mm. and I think she like eased me into it and then I went in my next one and I was like oh yeah this is easy and then they turned the camera on. I was like, okay, no, it's not. <laughs> but um, yeah, by the end of it, I think my last interview was with you in the tap room upstairs. And I was so tired. I just didn't care anymore. I was like, whatever comes out, comes out. 
and if they don't like it they can edit it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but I was me so much like you're even really, like so physical as well like you know two two lessons a day and then having a camera shoved in your face like four times a day yeah exactly and then like especially our cross-country day it was so exhausting I mean I like it was my favorite day but we just honestly I think my step count one of the days was like 49,000 and I slept like a baby because I was so tired from running up and down the stables and then going out to the arena and moving the jumps and back down to the stables and tacking up and then up for interviews and down and oh it was exhausting I'm tired thinking about it but it was so much fun yeah would you do it again oh absolutely like yesterday so after the Ryder Academy, what has life been like for you since then? Um, exciting, really exciting, actually. Um, I've really grown into like social media stuff, and like I would be a, quite a private person, and I would say I still am. Like my socials are literally about my horse life, and that is it. And I think it's really important to keep like your life and your horsey life totally separate especially for social media um, because there still are those people that don't want to see you do well but there is also the larger amount that people do want to see you do well um, and that's simply the reason I do it for um, because there could be someone out there that is the same as me in terms of like they've brought themselves up from the bottom and they're just working their way up that ladder um, and you think you're an absolute nobody and okay to some people you might be a nobody but that's their opinion everyone's entitled to one and um now you know like I'm brand ambassador for a few brands people like reaching out to you will you do post if I if I send you merch and I'm like how do you even know who like I exist um and like really pushing you to do well and invested in you doing well and I think it's so exciting. And especially from Irish brands like Emma Keo from Equiar. She's so lovely and she just wants to do, see you do well. And Anita that works with her, like she sent me an email um, a couple of weeks ago. She'd seen obviously on my Instagram that I was out of saddle and stuff. And she was just like checking in with me and stuff. And I just thought, that's so nice. Like she took time out of her day to send me that email. Whereas they could have just been like, ah, oh, whatever um and yeah it's just so exciting I think I appreciate what I like I always appreciate what I have what I have but I think now I (coughs) I think now I'm like people people are noticing the work that I put in um and it's just given me that drive to go even further and I'm like just watch me how does it feel to know that people are like seeing that you are working hard as opposed to like you said at the shows people are going Meh. yeah I think it's scary as well you know like social media is very powerful um but it's yeah if it's used in the right way it can be very positive um and I think I think those years that you spent with horses thinking oh I'm getting nowhere you know we're going backwards not forwards and everything just sort of started falling apart but you kept going I think like this is the reward now have you had any like negative feedback at all or I mean you still get the odd little person that you know is an online instructor but (laughs) you know they're they're everywhere so I just sort of be like, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, again, it's their opinion and they're enti- entitled to it. Um, but I just don't listen to them. Like, um, if they aren't doing better than me, then I'm not going to take their advice. And that's not being cheeky or cocky. It's just if they're not doing one better than me, then they're not going to make me improve. Like, I only want to improve. Yeah, that's a great mindset to have and the thing about it is the people who are doing better than you tend to be the ones who actually support you they don't try and take you down yeah they want to see you do better because they have come from where you were like you know they we didn't all just wake up one day and be marvelous at everything the world would be boring if we were yeah very boring 
Yeah. Well, sure. Into horses. Life is never boring with horses. Absolutely not. No, absolutely. Um, not always in a good way, but it's always interesting. Yeah. Horses love to create drama. Yes. Yes, they do. When you least need it. But anyway. <laughs> I remember I was talking to someone I was in holidays recently and I was just saying, I was like, yeah, no, I, I, horses, I love horses. They're idiots, but I love them. And they're like, they're idiots. And I was like, yeah, they're just, they're just so stupid. But like, maybe we're the idiots, to be honest. Yeah, I would agree. We are crazy. I don't know if we're crazy, stupid or dedicated, but I'm going with the dedicated one there. I would say a combination of three. Yeah, probably. But in a good way, like, you know, just crazy doesn't mean bad. It just, no. It's just different. It's not boring. Yeah, but, like, you have to do something crazy to be seen to be different. So, yeah. Yeah, see, it works well. Yeah. So, what is in the future now for Megan? Oh, goodness. The big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to keep pushing forward. Um, My end goal is still Dublin. Um, that has been my goal since I was probably about six. Um, so yeah, if I get into that working hunter ring, um, there will be a lot of happy tears. Um, and I definitely think we'll be ready. We just need to get out jumping and stuff. Like the start of this year has went in the bin. Um, just horses and then my back and life just got in the road, sort of. But it didn't really knock me down. Like, you know, everybody goes through those phases. So I just sort of picked myself up and I got in the saddle on Monday. And I was like, right, let's go. I have three weeks until I get my last set of injections. So let's make it worthwhile. And then once I get them, then I'm going to go back jumping. And yeah, we go from there. Yeah, I love that mentality. You're just like, move on, keep going, like, and get the practice and stuff in when you can. Yeah, I mean, like, the world's not going to stop just because you have. So you got to take the time when you have it. Yeah, and there's a lot of people who would go, oh, I haven't had that last set of injections. Um, I'll just wait. But yeah. if you can do it, you should. Yeah, I mean, like, I want to get there and I want it bad. So if you want it bad, you got to work for it. Yeah. Absolutely. It's very true. So I think that was pretty much everything I have to ask you, Megan. But there is one question I ask everyone at the end of every episode of the podcast, and that is what is the best advice you've ever been given? Hmm. That's a tricky one. I love this one because I get this response a lot first. Um the best advice I've ever been given. Oh, goodness. You could have pre-warned me on this one. Oh, no, I don't. That's why. I don't want to talk to anyone <laughs> about this one. Um, you're going to have a lot of editing for this time that I'm going to think for. Oh, no, I leave this part in because I saw everyone going, hmm. hmm. <laughs> you can um, pick more than one if you need to as well, which is what I normally do. The best advice. If it was easy, everybody would do it. And I keep being put in the spot. Oh my goodness. I can't think. <laughs> um You can leave it with that one. Yeah. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Yeah. Um absolutely true. I think yeah. it's a good one. Yeah. And like, like sometimes these simplest ones are like the best piece of advice, you know what I mean? It's it's the reason that came to your head first, you know yeah totally but it's true it is true absolutely so that's pretty much everything I just want to thank you first for coming coming on today and before you go can you tell everybody where they can find you yeah so you can get me on Instagram and my handle is life on Meg's rain and I'm pretty much mostly active there otherwise you can get me on Facebook so just my name, Megan Norton. And yeah, either of those platforms, catch me there. Brilliant. And as ever, guys, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok. So on Instagram, it's at strong the saddle with an underscore. Then TikTok is at strong the saddle without an underscore because I got there first. 
and <laughs> the website is www.chrissyhawkins.com so yeah I just want to say thanks again for joining today thanks for having me on Chrissy I really do appreciate everybody who listens to this podcast so if you please could help me with the algorithm and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and even you know if you want to reach out and suggest topics for me I'd be delighted to hear from you drop me a DM on Instagram or TikTok and thanks again for listening Mm -hmm.